So my mission, my niche was really like, how do we take this valuable yeah. asset that we have and make it something useful for the organization to grow, to be competitive, you know, to be efficient. And yeah. so it just became my passion. Well, hello everyone. Today I get a chance to talk with somebody who I've gotten to know on phone conversations, everything who's been helping us as a mentor for Resource Global. But now today we get a chance to meet face-to-face -face and have a face-to-face -face conversation. Joanne, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. I'm excited to be here. And thanks for the invitation, Tommy. Now, here we are. Where's home for you? Where are you at right now, Joanne? I live in a little town called Portola Valley, California, which is five miles from Stanford University. So oh, I good. say that because it's this little rural town right in the middle of Silicon Valley. <laughs> yeah. Now, for you, a lot of times, how long have you lived there? And hmm. where's home for you? Yeah, this is my home. We have lived here 24 years now um, and seven years more. Uh, before this in California. My husband and I both grew up in Massachusetts, but we've been out here the majority of our life. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. And for you, a lot of times is I can sit here and read your LinkedIn, your bio and all that stuff. Talk to me about your work journey. Yeah. You know, I really can't talk about my work journey without telling you a little bit more about my um, focus in college. In college, I was yeah. a social psychology major. And oh. I say that because it's really important and it has contributed greatly to leadership for me and my, my career in leadership, even though when I graduated from college, I thought I would go into organizational design. But as the economy would have it, it was recession and nobody was hiring in HR. So I had to fall back on my other love, which is math. Uh, yeah, so yeah. I went into finance uh, right out of college. But I think what really, um, even though I was in finance and I was learning and, and learning about the business, what really had my heart and what in, really interested me is how people work yeah. and what motivates people to work and how do they communicate and how do they make decisions. So I, I wanted this bigger picture with people in the center of it which again goes back to my heart for people and, and social psychology. <laughs> and so, you know, from that career, um, I quickly learned that data was the currency of business, uh -huh. right? Current yeah, data yeah. and information. And that led me into really another 30 years of focusing both from a business perspective and an IT technical perspective around data management. And, and it gave me, it opened the door to my, my career and my career success, but it really allowed me to lead global teams um, into uncharted territory around big data and fast data, you know, and all of that is a precursor of Gen AI, which we're all leaning into yeah. now. But that really has been my journey. And I think the psychology background shaped me my curiosity about people and how people yeah. work and what motivates them shape me. And then figuring out my niche, that data management really was a passion for me yeah. because I saw yeah. the possibilities. And that led me to global industry and, yeah. and getting that experience. Yeah. Joanne, when you were like a young girl, high school, growing up and all that stuff, like what made you decide that this was, you love studying human behavior? Yeah. Was there something that you were passionate about growing up? Um, there was a lot of divorce in my family. And I think because of that, I tried to figure out a lot of things uh, relationship wise. Yeah. And that just naturally led me into, you know, once I was introduced to psychology and sociology in high school, it's like, this is what I want to do. This God. is, I'm all about people and how people are together. And so, you know, it wasn't a great um, motivator to get into it, but it really did help me, one, resolve a lot of understanding of my childhood, yeah. but also to carry forward into leaning into people. Yeah. Yeah. As you look back, what were some of those skills that really said, Hey, this helped me to work with global teams? Because one of the things that you mentioned is that whole background and education really helped prepare you. What was it about it? As you look mm -hmm. back, that really helped you prepare. Yeah. I think that because data was my focus, it gave me not only the opportunity, but I, I saw that the only way to really manage 
data in a corporation is to take a very enterprise view to understand how finance uses data, how sales uses it, how operations uses it, how manufacturing <laughs> uses it. And so I intentionally put myself in a leadership position where I would be the one to try to understand across an organization Got it. what, got, got, what, got, what got. we should be doing. And, and what led me, a lot of the companies I work for in Silicon Valley are global companies. So just by nature of the the organizations I joined, it it led me to traveling through Asia, through manufacturing sites, or traveling yeah. through Europe for yeah. for sales organizations. So um, that's kind of how. But but I think really the crux is, and one of the things that I really encourage people I mentor is be curious, get a broad perspective. Yeah. You know, don't be siloed in what you know, what you know should be connected to other things. And once you have a broader perspective of an organization, you can see where you can make an impact. Yeah. Yeah. Another thing you mentioned, which caught my attention is you found your niche. How does a yeah. person find their niche? I think, I think when it's like finding your passion, <laughs> you know, um, as I said, my discovery was that data is the currency of an organization. And that was my niche. I knew from that point on, I was driven to understand how, how to make data meaningful and relevant. So you have to think this was like in the late 90s, early 2000s, when data was just a commodity. It was it was information you gathered, but there was no consistency to it. There was no sharing of it. There was, so my mission, my niche was really like, how do we take this valuable yeah. asset that we have and make it something useful for the organization to grow, to be competitive, you know, to be efficient? <laughs> And yeah. so it just became my passion. Got it, got it, got it. And Joanne, I realized for me, even as I listen to you, my passion is working with leaders and helping the light bulb go off. Mm -hmm. And that is my passion. But my niche that I realized in the last couple of years is I can literally create something out of nothing. Yeah. You put me into a city. You put me into a random city. I could create you a network pretty easily. And people would sit there and say, so can you write it down? Can you show me what you do? I said, I have no idea. I just know how to do it. But it took me a while to figure out what that niche was. And mm -hmm. I realized I had to try different things. Mm -hmm. I had to really be able to learn from it. I'm 47 years old now. It took me 47 years because I built cell towers. I went to business school. I went to seminary. I was a pastor. But I had to try figure, right. many different things to figure out what my niche is. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So now, like, for instance, as you think back about your life, what was a job that as you look back and says, wow, this job was just a wonderful portion, part of my life. And I learned so much from this job. Well, how, what would you say to that answer? Well, I think you learn from everything. <laughs> I think the most impactful job where I felt like I grew the most and I contributed the most was when I was at Western Digital. Got it. And I was the leader of enterprise data management. No, no surprise there. But it it moved me from and, and if people are listening and they're not really data people like me, <laughs> you have to think there's two different there's multiple different types of data. One is transactional, your sales order, your invoices, yeah, you know, yeah. it's more transactional. At Western Digital, I, I got to move into engineering data. So binary data, ones and zeros, and working with engineers to how do you translate that in manufacturing lines? And so it just opened up a, a whole broad spectrum for me of opportunity, you know, big data and the cloud and fast data. It just opened my eyes to, again, it's the currency of the organization, but it's not one thing. It's many things and what a significant impact um, these different technologies can have on, on organizational health, on manufacturing, on, you know, even um, the company, you know, was awarded um, Economic World um, Forum award <laughs> because of this big data platform and all that they could do. So I think it was the most impactful career for me. Yeah. 
from that regard. But I also think it's where I grew as an individual from a senior director to a vice president to a CIO. You know, it yeah. really, it was the trajectory of my my leadership career as well. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And you were probably, especially in the early years, like right now, everyone's talking about data, there's data <laughs> analysts, all that stuff. That's our majors coming out of college. But during your, that time, it was brand new. Yeah. How did you navigate in areas that you didn't know the answer to? How did yeah. you, how, as a leader, what did you do? Yeah, it really was pushing a rock uphill for a long yeah. time. People knew it was necessary, but didn't want to commit, didn't want to be accountable to the data in ways that I knew if we could invest in ownership and stewardship of our data, we'd be able to reap the benefits of it. Yeah. And so yeah, it really yeah. was pushing a rock uphill. And then there was this catch, you know, and it's, it, you, you you can look at the timeline over the last, you know, 20 years and you can see where that catch happened right? is when, oh, now analytics becomes so important and competing on an analytics became so important and whole industries grew just to have technologies around data, you know, and now here we are in Gen AI <laughs> right? and, and there's a fear of it. But there's always been a fear of it. We've just gotten used to our capabilities over yeah. time. And the same thing will happen with Gen AI. Yeah, yeah. Okay, Joanne, completely. Uh, you, yeah. you made me think of a leadership question. I was literally driving with this young intern who was in <laughs> seminary. And she's starting her internship. And she was sitting there literally telling me, sometimes, Tommy, how do you work in a situation where you have certain ideas and the organization you work with just aren't open ideas? She says, I find that I just push back and rebel. And I said to her, I said, you got to be careful of that because if you constantly mm -hmm. rebel and constantly push back, eventually they'll disregard you. So you got to figure a way to manage mm -hmm. up. How did you have to learn as a leader with ideas that people weren't comfortable with to constantly push mm -hmm. a little bit and get people to buy in? Yeah. You know, this is going to sound like a strange way to start that response, <laughs> but you have to be believed to be heard. I believe yeah, that yeah, so yeah. strongly. Mm -hmm. And so you have to establish trust and you have to establish a real personal character in order for people to even want to hear your ideas, even if they're great ideas, you know? So I would encourage people who feel like I have so many great ideas, but nobody's listening to me. I would ask them, how closely do they know the people they're talking to? Yeah. What is their point of view? How can you speak to where they are and connect your idea into, into their space? What's important to them, right? If you just come out of this, I have an idea and you all need to accept it. You're talking to a wall. They Leaders get hundreds of ideas a day, right? So you have to connect. You have to build that trust yeah. and you have to. Connect. And in reality, Joanne, right? Sometimes you're going to work with a leader who's not very good. And sometimes your idea is pretty good. But yeah. then at the same time, you can't just sit there and knock him or her or criticize him. You've got to figure out a way to get them to buy into the idea. And like you said, it takes time. It takes time to build trust and credibility to speak into his or her life. Yeah. I'll say one more thing about that because this is a personal experience and it really has shaped me and it's shaped really the whole mentorship um, passion that I have. And that I did have a leader when I was young in my career, vice president of finance, and she was hard. She was really tough on her organization, which I came to learn was one of the most impactful growth areas for me. You know, the way she was made me be better. And, the, yeah. and what she taught me was that, and what she taught all of us is if you brought her a problem, she would not answer it. She would not entertain. If you brought her a situation, a problem, with three potential solutions, then she was all ready to engage. And yeah. what she taught us was that if you have a problem, 
your first answer is the easy thing. It's off the top of your head. It's probably not the best answer, but it's an answer. But if you look to the second thing that you might do to solve that problem, you're going to give dig deeper and you're going to think about that problem from a different perspective in order to come up with a better yeah. solution. Yeah. And if you get to the third answer, now yeah. you have really gone out of the box. You have unleashed possibilities because you've had to think really hard. Then she wanted to talk. Because now you've gotten at something that you're not just throwing over the wall. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you are now ready to talk about something very creative yeah. and innovative and probably would make an impact. Yeah. So a lot of yeah. times when people bring like your friend, when they bring, I have a great idea, I have a great idea. What problem is it solving? And is it the best way to solve that problem? Have you yeah. really dug deep? Love it. Love it. Love it. And also for some of those guys who are listening in on this conversation, whether it's from Nairobi or Hong Kong or Singapore, or Jakarta and all that stuff. One of the things that I love what Joanne said is that interaction with her boss or leader still resonates her, with her to mm -hmm. this day. A good person, a good potential leader is one that's observing people that you interact with. What is it about your leadership skills that I resonate with, that I could learn from? What is it that I don't want to apply with? And so you're always watching, you're always learning and applying different okay. skills. Love that, love that. Joanne, for you, a lot of times, if you could talk and look back at your life, whether it's work, life and all that stuff, is there a defining moment in your life when it came to those work years that you sit there, Tell me that this really changed the trajectory of my life. Or mm -hmm. sometimes mm -hmm. these defining moments, we don't know when it comes. We don't know when it happens. Was there a defining moment in your life? Well, the one I just talked about had a pretty big impact because I actually took it beyond that coming up with three possible answers into really thinking, and I'm just going to call it what I how I present it to mentees, safe scary and unimaginable. Uh, when you think yeah. about okay. your your career, when you think <sighs> about raising children, when you think about ministry, when you think about any of those things, think about it in the context of what is the next step I can take that is safe, right? I know I can do it. I know I'm capable of it. And I know that it's available to <clears> me. <throat> That's one option. The yeah. next is scary, meaning I really want to take a new challenge. I really want to move into a new area. I really want to step back and go to school. You know, yeah. these are like scary things because they get you out of your, your comfort zone. But the unimaginable, which going back to my finance friend, it was like the third dot. <laughs> the unimaginable is when you really think, if I didn't put all these constraints on myself, what do I really want to do? Yeah. What goals do I really want to set? And the reason that this is so important, Tommy, is not that you go do your unimaginable immediately, but once you name it, you would be so surprised at how often these opportunities are around you and have been yeah. around you. Yeah. But because yeah. you didn't name it, because yeah. you weren't looking for it, they were passing you by. So I think just that, that, you know, those three dots have had a major impact mm. on my career because I, I, I take myself to new scary situations, right? I wanted to get into engineering data. <laughs> like I didn't know what I was doing in that space, but it was my unimaginable. I wanted to experience that. And it ended up being the best career decision I could make. So I really encourage people to, to, to dare to dream, if you can say it that way too. Um, and, and I have been a darer of that dream for my entire career. I don't, I, I, the other thing that I think I learned as a, as part of that process <laughs> is bring what you have to the new situation. You're just going to apply it differently. I, when I mentor, especially women, when I mentor them, they feel like I, I don't have the capability. I don't have the experience. I don't check all the boxes. 
But in actuality, you have something great based on your experience that you could bring and apply it differently there that they haven't even tried before. Yeah. You know, so, so yeah. we live, we often um, have this limiting narrative yeah. <laughs> for ourselves. And I think I learned early and just, I learned to trust myself that I know what I know. I know there's things I don't know, but I'm willing to learn. And therefore I'm not going to be shy to give input when ask a question in a new situation. I'm just going to give it from my perspective, from my experience. And maybe that's exactly what they needed. Yeah. Yeah. Joanne, you remind me I, when I was in seminary, we had this one professor and his syllabus was just kind of crazy. And you're sitting there, it was just unclear. And the first couple of weeks you're sitting in class, he's lecturing, he's giving assignments. It was so unclear. No, everybody was just so frustrated with him. And, and they started griping, complaining. And the professor finally sat down and he says, Hey, look, when you are a pastor or a ministry leader or whatever it is, you're never going to have clear answers. I need you to think. I need you to look at options, yeah. all of those. Things. I will never forget that lo lesson because he really helped. He says, in those ministries, look at your options. Look at all of those different things because no one's going to tell you what to do. And, and even with you, a lot of times, there are times when we go in life and we don't know where to go. It, it's like after yeah. 40 years in the book of Joshua, God says, to Joshua, tell them to pack up everything because today you're going to the promised land. Yeah. Well, we've been here for 40 days, for 40 <laughs> years. <laughs> we've never gone to the promised land why can't we just stay here you've been feeding us for 40 years exactly yeah. exactly oh man so and now good. joanne even for you your life you're making a transition now aren't you i am making a transition yes um so let me give you a little context and background to that even though i've been in industry for 40 years um hate to admit that but it's true <laughs> By the I way, have... you look very young for having been in 40 <laughs> years, all right? <laughs> the camera. Um, I have always had a passion for my for for my faith, my church, uh, serving in different ways. At my home church, I was on session, which is our elder board. Um, I was chair of session. I've been a director on board of Faith, Work, faith and Work Journey. Um, I'm on the board of a a church school in Spain and Denia, Spain. Oh, My husband good. and I you're both good. served there. So I've always had a passion for ministry and yet I've always done it alongside my work. I've always made time for it, but it wasn't the center to what, where I spent my time, but I always had a passion to make time to do that. And I just decided maybe it's make it's time to make time to put that central in my life. So I am still doing some things in industry. I'm advising on for some companies. Um, you know, I've, I've taken my leadership role to another level of leadership within industry, yeah. Yeah. but have made time to to have really a focused um, career and energy in in ministry right now. So yeah. very exciting. Oh, uh, are you able to share? What will you be doing? Are you, are you taking a yeah. role somewhere or what are, what are some sure, of your options? Sure. Um, I'm working with an organization called Wellspring. Wellspring has been um, around for 30 years. You can look them up, wellspringca.org. And it began 30 years ago with the founders focused on women, particularly and caring for the souls of women. And it was yeah. called Women at the Well. Yeah. And about 17 years ago, 18 years ago, the men were like, well, what about us? What about our souls? <laughs> we need we need caring. So um, about 17 years ago, they created a program called Soul Care. And it really is the care for pastors and ministry leaders. You know, as you know, Tommy, in ministry, um, you can your soul can be depleted pretty quickly. I mean, oh, yeah. there's a lot of burnout. There's a lot of conflict. There's, you know, just internal conflict, external conflict, and and depletion because you give so much. So this is a nine month program, cohort program, for for pastors and ministry leaders, that really is spiritual formation 
for pastors to give them yeah. that space and that place through through nine months of retreats, um, spiritual yeah. direction, et cetera. So my role in all of that is more the business side. Um, I'm coming at it as the, the a partner um, responsible for development as well as business management. So all yeah, of yeah, yeah. and finance. How has the transition been from working in a fast paced business side to yeah. now a ministry, which is a little bit different. And the say, reason I say this is I remember building cell towers for 10 years. Everything was fast paced, everything like that. And then I start working in ministry. Oh, a little slower, a little slower. Yeah, <laughs> it is. It's It was one month yesterday that I started. So yeah. <laughs> the first month has been a lot of, you know, just acclimatizing to to the ministry, learning a lot, learning a lot about, you know, our support that we have for the ministry. Um, so, I, I mean, there's lots to learn, right? So at this point, um, I'm just taking a lot in, contributing where I can, but also starting to look strategically yeah. at some of the areas of growth and some of the areas of engagement um, that the ministry can have. So um, it's exciting. It's it's small, um, lots of wonderful people to work with. And um, I'm working with the founder too, which is yeah. super exciting. Very, very, very good. Yeah. Joanne, as you look back at your life, I mean, you sit there and say, Lord, here I am right now. I started this in my college major. Then I went to finance. Then I went to data. And suddenly now I'm not doing anything with data. I'm still doing some of this stuff. But I'm now working in terms of spiritual care, emotional care for pastors and ministry leaders. What do you think God's been teaching you all this time? Yeah. How'd you get over here? How did I get over here? So I'm going to tell you an experience and a story that I had from yeah. uh, being in Faith and Work Journey, which was <clears throat> another nonprofit, which has become Faith, Work, and Tech here in the Bay yeah. Area. Um, but as a board member, I also went through the, the program. And part of that program asked everyone to do a project very similar to what you're doing, right, with the Gospel Action Plans, Gospel, but to yeah, do a project. Yeah. And you had to pick whatever project you wanted that really illustrated the integration of faith and work. And so years before, I had done um, Donald Miller's storyline, if you're familiar yeah. with that. Yeah, and I had done that and looked at like from birth on, what are all the highs and lows of my life and where was God in all of those times? So I decided to do that for my career. So from the time I got out of college through 40 years of different companies, different jobs, different roles, even getting married, having two kids, <laughs> I looked at this timeline and at every juncture, I looked, I, I challenged myself to think about what were the big milestones during that time for me. Yes, yeah, 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 yeah. And to that, I had to name where was I with God and where was God with me and what did he teach me? Yeah. So I put together this very, <laughs> this is the data part of me, a yeah. huge spreadsheet. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> but you know, Tommy, it really, it really opened my eyes to, and we all have had this experience, you know, realizing God was there when I didn't know it or wasn't yes. looking for God <laughs> to be, let's, especially coming out of college. It's like, you know, the world was my oyster. I wasn't really dependent, depending on God at that point in time to, to take me to the next step. But I can tell you in retrospect, I see how he kept me from bad things right? And how he opened doors for me, nobody else could have opened. And so, you know, I had to admit there were times I was in the desert. There were times that I had surrendered. There were times that I was just lavishly loved. There were, you know, and, but the important thing was just stepping back from it and thinking about it and, and realizing God has always been here in my yeah. life. And so, when I decided to make this transition, it was with a lot of prayer to say, okay, what's next? You know, yeah. to really, really say, you know, partner with God and say, where are we going next? Where do you want me to be? Yeah. And I just prayed that he would shut down opportunities that I shouldn't take and provide 
opportunities I should. And through that, I just met a lot of people in ministry. And I just decided to take every single introduction, every single coffee, every single... (laughs) That's how I met you, Tommy. You were part of this transition for me. Thank you. Yeah. You know, when Nancy said, I would like you to meet Tommy Lee, Tommy Lee has an opportunity for you to do mentoring. I said, yes. I just decided to be at this point of just saying yes, because I really felt it was God's leading to open these doors. Yeah, yeah. And through that, I was led to Wellspring and I was led to Nexus Mentoring. I know, you know, my good friend, Sandy King. So it really has, it's helped. That has made the transition for me. Yeah, yeah. And Joanne, it's been a pleasure just even getting to know you and just having you mentor one of our young ladies. But even for those people who are sitting here, I across the board, one of the things I've realized is I meet all these young marketplace leaders and they sit there and tell me, I just want to serve God. I just want to serve God. I'm so passionate. But they're always looking ahead, but they're not reflecting. Joanne, mm-hmm. it goes back to that same professor at seminary who was also my uh, my right before I graduated, he had to sit there and meet with me. And he says, tell me, I've known you for four years and you've done well in the corporate world, but you go, 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 and you love do, do, do. But for some reason, you don't stop and reflect. You you do not slow down. I don't understand why I don't understand. But if you do not learn how to stop and reflect, you will truly never know what God is trying to teach you. And Joanne, it wasn't until I had cancer right in my nostril and I went through 10 weeks of intense radiation every single day and chemo for once a week where it was God says, if you don't stop, I'm going to force you to stop and I'm going to force you to reflect. And I had to learn how to reflect. Yeah. And it taught me a lot of things about the insecurities in my life, the anger in my life some of the heart issues that I had to wrestle with. Mm-hmm. And that really allowed me to become secure in who I am today. Yeah. 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 I mean, it's, I've, we've talked about your story before and it is to the, to your point, it is so important and God will slow us down. God will yeah. slow us down Yeah, and we will either recognize it and lean into it or we'll fight it. But yeah. But what comes out of it is so much better. (laughs) It does remind me like the story of David. When Samuel is asking Jesse to bring in all his sons and David's forgotten. And then Jesse whispers to him, he anoints him as the next king. And then there's David and Goliath. And then after that, you would think everything goes well. He becomes king. No, 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 no. Saul goes after him. And for some reason, God chooses to take all his crutches. He loses his job. He goes to his wife. He can't go there. He goes to Samuel. Samuel tries to hide him. Can't go there. Then from that point, runs to Jonathan. Can't go there. He ends up in the Philistines. He pretends like he's a crazy man. He only stayed there for a long time. He ends up in the cave of Adullam and writes Psalm 57 and 132. Why in the world did God pull all these different crutches around from him when things were going so well? He had to have David learn what it meant to have nothing but him. Yes. Yes. Yeah. I love what you're doing at Wellspring. Love what you're doing. Love what you're doing. Thank you. Joanne, how can people find you? I mean, it's it's over 35 minutes that we're sitting there here talking. I, <laughs> I feel like it's just like a conversation. We're having coffee. We're getting to know, know each other. But mm-hmm. how can people find out about Wellspring, about yourself, about all of those things? Yeah. Well, probably LinkedIn is probably the place where you'll yeah. find the most about me. Um, I haven't updated LinkedIn lately. Um, I have just done a podcast out there for um, leader stories. So if yeah. you find me on LinkedIn, you can find my leader story as well. Yeah. Um, so that's a way to get to, to know me. Um, Wellspring is wellspringca.org. Um, go Got out. It. We have a website there. You can look at it. Um, right now, Wellspring has been serving the Bay Area. We've had 450 pastors go through the program over the okay. last 17 yeah. years. And now we're expanding to Southern California. And next year, we're going to expand to the to east the East Bay. Um, 
So it's it's a California thing at this point, although our pastors who've gone through the program have moved themselves. So they're all over the country. And so they're taking their learnings to different places as well, which is super exciting. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Very, very good. Joanne, thank you so much for finding some time. Thank you. Yeah, thank I am you. so honored that Nancy introduced us together because I, I've just enjoyed getting to know you. You as well. So thank you. And um, I look forward to hearing all of the gospel action plans from the U.S. cohort <laughs> coming up. 